All right. Well, howdy, folks, and welcome to the Hump Day Hanger Presentations by SuperGov.org and the Not So Straight Level Podcast. Um, sorry about last week. Uh, Kevin Quinn had warned me when uh, we signed him up that if the weather was really great for heli skiing, there was a good chance that he was going to have to postpone, and that is what happened. So um, hopefully he will show us some pictures of heli skiing. Uh, when, when he is able to do it. I know he'll be back. Uh, probably that season is going to be over here sometime in April. So uh, maybe we'll be able to hook back up with him then. Next week, uh, Ernie Hansen is going to be giving a program on three friends flying to Alaska and why you should go too. So uh, we're looking forward to that. Uh, after that, we don't currently have anything scheduled. Uh, we're always looking for new folks to do these presentations, and um, we're considering taking a bit of a summer hiatus, uh, depending on demand. So uh, I'm interested in your thoughts of uh, whether or not we should just uh, maybe do it once a month or a couple times a month or just take a couple week, couple months off this summer, uh, quit all together. Uh, you do it every day. You know, let us know. I'm just kind of curious what your thoughts are on that. So uh, I really appreciate your support. Your support of supercup.org um, is what keeps this program going and uh, keeps me going too. So uh, thanks so much for uh, supporting supercup.org and, and thereby supporting this program. Uh, tonight, you will, uh, during tonight's presentation, you'll be able to ask questions in the chat, the Zoom chat, or in the YouTube chat if you're watching on YouTube. So uh, feel free to ask questions. I've talked with uh, presenter tonight. Is agreeable to be interrupted if, uh, if it's a pressing question. So pop that in there. Be sure to send that question to everyone. Don't send the question to Henny himself or Joel as he is listed as. Um, and uh, because he may not be reading it because he'll be busy doing other things. So be sure to send it to everyone or to Laura or I. So tonight's presenter is uh, Joel Henny Youngman. He served 26 years as a naval aviator, flying the EA-6B Prowler and the F-18 Hornet off just about every U.S. aircraft carrier in service. He's a graduate of the U.S. Naval Te Pest Test Pilot School, logged over a thousand arrested landings, and successfully ejected following catastrophic engine failure. Henny holds an ATP, CFI, CFII, MEI, a and single engine C, and multi-engine C ratings. He spent five and a half years in Alaska flying his personal Super Cub on floats, wheels, and skis. He also flew two sixes and beavers for Rust's Flying Service in Anchorage for a summer, and then two full years of full-time flying beavers for Andrew Airways in Kodiak. Henny is now the lead beaver pilot for the U.S. Forest Service in Ely, Minnesota, flying fire, search and rescue, medevac, and numerous natural resource missions since January of 2017. Currently flies a personal Cessna 185 with wife Jennifer and fluffy friend Yuli. Welcome, Henny Youngman. Thanks, Steve. Good evening, everybody from beautiful old northern Minnesota, where we still have ice on the lakes and uh, not a lot of snow left. But um, going to give you an overview of the Forest Service Beaver Program here in Ely. Um, it's got a long and distinguished history, and um, we're pretty proud of it, and uh, we really enjoy spreading the word about it. So before I start, uh, Steve, I just want to thank you for the opportunity. Um, I was humbled when you asked, uh, when I look at the list of folks that you've had on, you know, Paul Klaus, Lori McNichol, Steve Pierce, you and Laura, uh, Randy Korfman, and the list goes on. Um, I, I'm really humbled to be able to to come and present. So thanks, thanks very much for doing this and for all you do with the website. Um, it's, it's a treasure. So, um, yeah, so I brought my friend with me, so he won't be answering any questions, but um, he's there for moral support. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here and we'll jump right in. How's that look, Steve? It looks beautiful. All right. It looks like Photoshop, though. <laughs> no, that is a that is an actual uh, <laughs> photograph from uh, the Pagami Wildland Fire in 2011 in the uh, Boundary Water. So um, that's me. I'm the supervisory uh, beaver pilot. Um, one of two of us here currently, with a third one on the way. Um, and we're based in uh, Ely, like we said, on the Superior National Forest base. 
All right. Uh, standard disclaimer here. Um, what I'm going to talk about is, uh, you know, my opinions, my views of what we do here. Um, they do not purport to reflect the opinions of the federal government, the Forest Service, the U.S. Forest Eastern Region, or any of its members. So uh, I'll try not to embarrass myself, but I think that covers us. Here's what I'm going to talk about. A um, little bit about our location, where we're at, so you know um, some history of the program. Um, and in there, I'll talk about all the various uh, aircraft that we've used. Our current aircraft, our fleet of three to Haviland Beavers. Um, the configurations that we fly in, some of the uh, modifications and safety items that we have. Uh, pilot requirements to fly here and how we hire. Um, a couple of quick slides about how I got here. Steve kind of covered it all. Um, manning, uh, how we're manned, how we're supposed to be manned and how we currently are. And then kind of the meat of it is the, the current operations and missions. So what we do, how we do it and how we support um, the Forest Service and our other partners. So a couple others, there's others there at the end and then uh, just a couple items about the future of the program. All right, so we are in Ely, Minnesota, which is uh, up in the Arrowhead region. Um, at its closest point, the Canadian border is about 15 or 16 miles from us. So that gives you an idea of where we're at. The, the Forest Service itself is divided into uh, nine regions, and we're in the eastern region, the one in green there, or region nine. Um, you might be wondering, since you see region 10, and why I said there's nine, it's because Region seven was abolished back in the 60s. It wasn't abolished, they just combined two regions. So uh, Google map shot here, we're about a four hour drive uh, north of Minneapolis, St. Paul and about a two hour drive straight north of Duluth. So just to get yeah, oriented. We primarily support the Superior National Forest there in the blue. Um, you can see where Ely is in relation to that with our booming population of 3,460 people, probably on a good day. Um, the Superior National Forest is roughly 3 million acres in size. We also do support for the Chippewa National Forest in the north central uh, area of the state, and that's about 1.6 million acres. In inside the Superior is Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness, which is um, a total wilderness area, so no motorized anything allowed with a couple of exceptions. There's a couple of lakes uh, right around the edge that do have a... Uh, allow outboard motors up to 25 horse, but those are those are few and far between. But other than that, uh, no boats, no motorcycles, no snowmobiles, no four wheelers and in there. So it's uh, canoes, kayaks, hiking, and uh, that's about it. So, and that's roughly 1 million acres and it's completely inside the Superior National Forest. Uh, there is prohibited airspace over um, all of the boundary waters. So it's basically everything below 3000 feet MSL. Um, you can't fly in. So um, when you think about prohibited areas, you usually think about like Camp David, the White House, where the president is, that kind of stuff. Um, the story I heard is that when this was put into effect, it was actually supposed to be a restricted area, but somehow got screwed up and it was made a prohibited area. So anyway, um, we here at the Beaver program are usually the only folks that are allowed to fly in there. And that's not very often we have to get permission from the supervisor of the Superior National Forest. So, um, so the prohibited areas, just like the boundary waters are broken up into three areas. So you got P205 on the westernmost part, the largest part P204 in the middle and all the way up to the border. And then on the Eastern edge, uh, P206. If you wonder why there's these uh, cutouts here on the ends of P204, um, that's where this is Grand, the town of Grand Marais. And, and if you ever heard of the Gunflint Trail, that runs right up through this cutout here all the way up to Saginaga Lake up by the Canadian border. And then this cutout on this side uh, is the Echo Trail that runs from the town of Ely up and then over towards uh, Cook, Minnesota. And then the last uh, location slide here, just a couple more parks I want to show you here. You got Quetico Provincial Park in Canada, which is, I just looked it up, 1.2 million acres. It basically parallels the boundary waters there, runs right along the border as well. So the next one is Voyagers National Park, which is up northwest of us uh, on the Canadian border. Big area for uh, houseboating and water sports up, up that way. And then the third one is uh, Voy uh, not Voyagers, Isle Royal National Park. Uh, it has the distinction as being the least visited of the national parks, but I've heard it's the most, it has the most repeat visitors. So uh, it's technically in Michigan, although it's a lot closer to um, Minnesota than it is to Michigan. And I'll talk about uh, 
those last two here a little bit as we go on. Okay, so like I said, a long history. Um, the, the quick summary of us is um, flow planes have been flying for the Superior since the late 20s. Um, the Forest Service has had actual, you know, airplanes that it owned here since the 30s. Our facility's been here since the 40s, and we're currently flying three airplanes that were built in the 50s and the 60s. So uh, nothing real new about here, but we, uh, we keep it going. So uh, one of the few slides that has a bunch of words on it. So uh, like I said, late 1920s, uh, the Forest Service began using local pirate pilots. They'd fly, or fly fire detection and firefighter transport missions. Uh, Mid-1930s uh, was the first contract issued for a seaplane use on the Superior. And then in 1938, when they realized that this is actually a good way to, to get firefighters around and to spot fires, uh, they decided to get their own aircraft because they couldn't uh, rely on the, the vendors to always be available. So that first airplane was a Stinson SR-6A. I've got a couple of pictures of that here in a second. Early 1940s, construction began here on Shagawa Lake in Ely, uh, of a hangar, dock, and a ramp. And then from the late 30s through the mid 50s, and actually a little later than that, we had various uh, aircraft in use here at Chagua Lake. Got the first Beaver in 1956, the second one in 59. In 61, they expanded the hangar. And then in 67, we got our third Beaver. Just some of the uh, years and uh, names of the airplanes that we had, and I'll uh, go through these. You'll notice that some of, some of the airplanes we had for only a year or two, and then some of them we had for 10 or 12 years and the beavers we've obviously had for going on 60 years now. This is the first uh, airplane for the Forest Service, first float plane, Stinson SR-6A, it's a gull wing. Uh, and that's just on the public dock in Ely there uh, before the facility was built here on the lake. Uh, this is Merle Motrip, one of the uh, early pilots and apparently the, the Forest Service uniform back in the day was, was based on Errol Flynn, I guess, so. Um, Good looking man right there. That's the Stinson as well. Uh, and then the Stinson here, this is uh, in the boundary waters on Kekakabak Lake in 1938. So a real, real early photo. We actually have this blown up um, in the office here, right? It's a huge picture. So uh, kind of a cool shot there. And then uh, since we didn't have the facilities yet, the Stinson actually, some of the other airplanes were just moored out in the bay here. So you'd have to go uh, take a canoe or a boat out to get it. And I think there's actually somebody on the out there probably pumping it getting ready to go fly so uh the stinson actually i believe ended up in the trees after an engine failure and they replaced it with a piper j4 cub coupe seen here uh, that's flying on just a detection flight looking for smoke over the forest um nord nordine i believe norseman is how you say it um so the forest service bought one of those just for the uh more capability and to haul loads and stuff like that this is uh, the early hangar. And um, if you see there, it's got one wing in and one wing out. And I, I've heard that that airplane were actually fully in the hangar because it was too big. So uh, they kind of had to move parts in to work on them. So uh, the interesting thing here is uh, if you look at the wheels here, those are called beaching gear. And the theory is you, you taxi the airplane up into shallow water and then you wade in and put those on. There's, there's uh, fittings on the side of the floats. So there's, one gear on each side of the float, so four total there, and then you strap some smaller wheels on the back, and then you can basically push the airplane around. So we've had several sets of those for the Norsemen, and we actually have some beavers as well, and we still have those here. This was after a paint job, and then the addition of a, a three-blade prop on the Norsemen, and you can see that one is moored as well out in the out in the bay. So. Uh, they tried a CB. Uh, for a couple years, and um, it didn't work out well because the amphibian hull and the, the places we go in the boundary waters are usually pretty rocky and there's not nice sandy beaches like this. So um, that airplane was either sold or um, given away or something after a couple of years. So that one didn't last very long. That's Milt Nelson, or uh, yeah, Milt Nelson, one of our early pilots there with the CD. Uh, so I went back to some Stinson af Stinsons after that. Uh, you can see here they're loading two aluminum canoes, one on each side of the of this plane. I, I can only imagine what kind of ride that was, but um, apparently it worked all right because they did quite a bit of it. So uh, we had those airplanes for a while. Here's another one. And then the, the trivia question is, is always, why does it say Piper or Stinson instead of just Stinson? And I guess Piper actually built the Stinson back then. So, um, and that's a, 
picture from 49 or shortly thereafter, because that's a 49 airplane. Got into the uh, Cessnas. This is a early Cessna 180. Um, and this is when we began. It's hard to read there, but um, the airplanes are, are November 19er something Zulu. So I believe we started with this one. So this one's November 190 Zulu. And then as we go along, you'll see uh, the further airplanes go one, two, three, and all the way up to six and seven. So this was the first airplane that we put on skis. Those are a set of straight skis um, out on the lake there on Shagawa. So, and we used that airplane for quite a while, I think. Uh, there is it on floats after it was repainted. That was kind of the standard uh, paint scheme there for a while, the red with the right, white stripe. I believe those are uh, Edo 2580 straight floats at that airplane. Uh, moved up to an actual Cessna 185 after that. That's on, um, looks like a set of hydraulic skis. I'm not sure the types of those, but we had that airplane for a while. And then we actually went back uh, to a different uh, Cessna 180 again. So uh, that's the kind of the current paint scheme, the white with the red stripe. And you can see that's 196 Zulu there. So um, the numbers just keep kind of going. Uh, there's been times when we've had uh, multiple different airplanes at once. So uh, and this one, you can see there's two Stinsons on either side of the dock, uh, the Cessna 180 nosed in there, and then the Norseman. So uh, actually three different kinds there. And then at one point, we also had one Stinson, a 180, and then our first to have one beaver there on the right. So um, you can see down here on the left where the cursor is, is uh, an early cart that we used to bring airplanes out of the slip and up. Okay, so our current fleet of aircraft is our three uh, de Havilland Beavers. Uh, I'll go through each one here um, and talk a little bit about them. So uh, Beaver 1, 191 Zulu, uh, we got straight from the de Havilland factory in Toronto. So uh, I've been told that the gentleman on the right is either the de Havilland sales rep or the ferry pilot or contracting guy or whatever, but apparently he flew the airplane down uh, and delivered it right to us here. And it's, it's been here its whole life. So. Um, and I've got another interesting thing. This is actually the rotation to deliver the airplane. I know it's kind of hard to see, but uh, it was delivered on floats and they gave us a discount of almost $2,000 because they didn't include any land gear. And the total was roughly $73,500 for a brand spanking new Beaver with a brand new set of Edo floats. So um, I'm betting- I'll Steven take four of them. Yeah, I was going to say, I bet you guys would kill for one of those nowadays, as would most of us. So, uh, so it was built in 56. We got it uh, here at the hangar in 56. There's a serial number 1106. Um, for folks who don't know, to have it built roughly 1,600 and I think 50 beavers. Um, so that one was about halfway through, a little over halfway through the production line. And uh, I think roughly 1,000 of those are still flying around the world. So it's a pretty impressive number. Uh, that airplane, as of yesterday, had just over 18,000 hours on it. And right now it has a temporary dual yoke uh, installed so that we can use that for uh, float training. It doesn't have dual brakes. Uh, our other airplane has that. So uh, once we get our third pilot and get her trained up, then uh, that, that dual yoke will come out and it'll go back to being a single yoke. This is Beaver 2 uh, on the uh, pier here at Shago, as you can see, uh, waiting for the ice to go out in the rest of the bay. So. Sometimes it takes a while. Sometimes it happens overnight and you come in and everything's wide open. So looking forward to that happening again here soon. That was built in 59, 1347 on the serial number. We got it again from the factory. So two of our three airplanes, uh, we've had their whole lives. We have all their log books, uh, no damage history to the airframe. Um, really kind of a unique situation, especially for a beaver that, you know, those get crashed and damaged and sold and rebuilt and parted out and everything. So uh, kind of unique that we have two of those. This is our high time airplane with uh, just under 21,000 hours. And this has just the uh, throw over yoke in it. So this is kind of our workhorse. It seems like we put more, more hours on this airplane every year than the other two. And then uh, Beaver 3, 193 Zulu, built in 57, 1162 for the serial number. This was actually in the army for 10 years before uh, the government got it. Well, uh, Forest Service got it. Uh, low time airplane or airframe of 17,600 hours. And uh, this has a full time dual yoke and dual brake. So this is kind of our primary training airplane when we get these folks in. Uh, there is another B 
Beaver in the Forest Service. It's up in Alaska and Juneau. It's in Region 10. Uh, this is the Airplane 106 Foxtrot Sierra. It's on uh, WIP Amphibs, and this is uh, an old paint scheme. And uh, since it's it's actually a law enforcement airplane, they felt they had to have a badge on it somewhere, so they repainted it in the green and white with a big badge on the tail. So that airplane, uh, like I said, strictly does law enforcement missions, so it's not um, it's not capable of carrying the the water bombing tank that we do. Um, although we have had the airplane down here to help us during some of the bigger fires. So, and there's a single single pilot up in Juneau who flies that airplane. Okay, uh, I'm gonna go through some configurations and modifications for the airplanes. So when the airplane's on wheels, kind of in the shoulder seasons, uh, after we start getting ice, but it's not thick enough to fly off of on skis, we just put them on a Goodyear eight and a half by tens. And this picture's at the great Minnesota Aviation Gathering back in 2019, we flew the airplane down and we were uh, trying to recruit pilots because we were having a hard time getting them, so. And when we do put skis on there, uh, de Havilland hydraulic wheel skis, as you can see in that picture there, we have a set for each of the three airplanes. Uh, those are blown down by nitrogen in the upper part of the cylinder and then pumped up hydraulically by a handle in the cockpit. So uh, when they're fully down, if you want to get them fully up, it's anywhere between 100 to 125 pumps on the handle, depending on the position of the pump, how much fluid's in there, uh, how hard you're doing it, how fast you're doing it, that kind of stuff. So. Um, you end up at the end of the winter with a much larger right bicep than you do a left one because it's the most of the work. And then kind of the bread and butter is the, the Edo 4930 straight floats there. And you can see the water bombing tank. And I'll talk more about that here in a second. But uh, as soon as actually before the ice goes out, we have at least one airplane on those with a water tank on so that as soon as we can get it in the water, we push it in and then it's ready to go. And we'll put all three airplanes on those for the summer so we, uh, so we have that capability of all three of them. In the past, we did have a set of Edo, I think those are 475 amphibs, um, and used them for a while. They ended up getting rid of them because uh, they didn't work out real well with the, uh, the water bombing tank. The water bombing tank is very sensitive to center of gravity and, and the extra weight of the, uh, the amphibs uh, kind of messed with being, uh, being able to use the water tank. And also those are, those are fairly old and they were getting hard to find parts for, so we got rid of those uh, a while back. Here's our old panel. Um, I'm assuming this is probably what it came from the factory with, with maybe a couple of uh, radios or uh, transponders put in. Um, you see these four switches up there. I'll talk about those later, but those are uh, bomb switches. Within the last oh, four to five years, we've had all three airplanes completely redone panel-wise to uh, flat panels. So um, it's kind of overkill for what we do, but it's, uh, it's a really nice setup. So in front of the pilot here, uh, you've got a Garmin uh, five, G500 PFD at MFD, uh, really big and uh, lots of information there. And then just to the left of it, you got a Mid-Continent standby, standby Attitude Module or a SAM. In the middle panel here, you've got your uh, audio panel and then your FM radio number one. And uh, just as kind of a, a trivia thing, we're, we're one of the few... Well, I'm not sure how many have it. I know there's a lot more beavers that have the throttle on the left than the prop in the middle, but we still have the throttle in the center. So um, when when folks come here that have beaver experience, they, it takes them a while to figure out that they're they're trying to fly with the prop instead of the throttle, but you get used to it pretty quickly. So. Uh, this is in front of the co-pilot seat uh, stack that's tilted just a little bit so the pilot can see it a little bit better, but you got dual GTN 650s, COM, NAV, IFF, and then an FM radio number two. So all in all, a really, really nice system. Um, a lot of redundancy in it, and uh, it works pretty well for us. Okay, for some of the mods and safety items here, I just thought I'd throw this in because it was a cool picture. This was uh, a while back, but that one of the airplanes was flown down to the Duluth, to the Duluth Air Show, and they took a truck down with a bunch of our kind of extra stuff in there. So uh, this item right here on the left is the fish tank. And so to get that in, you have to take every seat in the airplane out, uh, except for the pilots. And then this barely fits in and just runs fore and aft right on the right side here. Uh, this strap you see here is for a uh, oxygen tank. And then there's uh, aeration tubes in each of these. And I'll talk some more about that here in a little bit. The second item here is a tree seating hopper. So that goes in and um, this little uh, item here goes down through the camera hatch. And then you just basically dump 
the tree seed in here and it uh, has a motor with an auger and it plugs into the auxiliary power of the airplane and you basically just uh, fly over and dump the seed out. Uh, this is our water bombing tank with our pickup tube. And then these uh, items over here on the right, they're, they're kind of cut off on my screen now if you can see them, but those are um, paracargo containers. Uh, we don't do that anymore, but those they used to put two of those on each float and you could actually resupply the firefighters in the field by dropping those and they would parachute down. Okay, for uh, the modifications, uh, we've got the Whip Air 5600 gross weight increase kit. Um, so they beef up the wing, they beef up the uh, tail section, and then they put these, uh, they call them flow generators, we call them moose antlers here. Basically think of VGs here right in front of the aileron just to keep that flow attached at low air speeds. So um, that's really helpful for us with the uh, water tank. Um, it gives the ability to carry that and operate that and also to carry you know bigger loads when we need. I talked a little bit about the camera hatch. This is actually two, two separate pictures. So this one on the left, uh, behind the second row of seats, if you lift this uh, floor panel up is this camera hatch. So this is the cover that's in place and it's got some latches here. And then when you undo those three latches and pull that up, uh, then you got this hole in the air and that's the hangar floor you're looking there. So this was designed to put the, you know, the big Kodak cameras um, of the 50s and 60s for taking pictures, but we use it for a lot of other things. Um, mostly dropping stuff out of the airplane. Um, Kenmore C fins on the uh, horizontal stab there, and then we also have the vertical fin uh, on the uh, on the underside of the empennage. Uh, those are both to improve directional stability. There's been a lot of confusion about whether you actually need this fin or not, or this uh, yeah this ventral fin if you have these Kenmore fins. And they just recently clarified that uh, if you have these fins and the 5600 kit and you fly on Edo 4930s, which is what we do, then this fin is required. So we ended up having to put these back on last year after a pretty long period of not having them. So um, I honestly can't tell a real difference when we're flying, but I can tell you that that thing uh, gets bumped into the into the pier and the dock a lot more than when it doesn't. So we fortunately we have a bunch of spares because those get dinged up pretty often. The pilot and the co-pilot have the uh, old style military seats that were designed for parachutes. So we got a lot of padding behind us. And then we have uh, the point uh, harness in there, which is really nice when you're flying over fires, dropping water and stuff, because you're going to get bounced around. And then when you release the water load, it's a pretty good jolt up. So uh, having that and being able to snug yourself in is pretty nice. We also have the uh, JPI fuel scan 450 fuel gauge, which is really nice. Uh, like, like most airplanes, you know, the the round gauges that bounce around are, are okay when you, you got a full or half full tank, but when you start getting down, you know, the last five to 10 games, those become pretty unreliable. So anybody who's used these know they're, they're like hyper accurate. So within, you know, 0.1 or 0.2 gallons. So that's a really nice thing to have. As far as safety items go, all of our airplanes uh, are equipped with automated flight following. This is just a screen grab. Um, if you think, you know, spider tracks or uh, in reach or something like that, it's basically the same thing. So uh, the airplanes here that you see with our, those are Minnesota DNR airplanes. And then our planes would just show up as their 193 Zulu or whatever. And then you've got some uh, contract helicopters here who also have to have it. So our dispatch offices over in Grand Rapids track all these. Um, and they basically, they're automatic. So as soon as the power comes on the airplane, then you're being tracked. So. We carry uh, satellite phones in all the airplanes, keep them fully charged, and we put them in a Pelican case there. Those are super useful out in the boundary waters when we have to land because our, our radio coverage goes away and there's no cell phone coverage out there. So we actually have the plan where those will work in Canada if we have to go into there, which, uh, which happens sometimes. We do carry viable gear just like uh, everybody does. Big red bags, got first aid, cook stove, some tools, a bunch of other stuff. Uh, we always carry an axe in the back because we're the Forest Service. Uh, in the wintertime, snowshoes and a metal shovel. And then uh, we also carry three sleeping bags, which, believe it or not, we've used in the middle of the summer when we pull somebody out of the water that's been there for a while because it's probably hypothermic. And I actually slept in the airplane one night, and it was, I was pretty happy that I had those. So. All right. Uh, just a reminder again, if you guys got any questions, feel free to chat in and, and interrupt, and we'll answer them. Pilot hiring. This is a question that we get asked a lot when we go to uh, Oshkosh or the Great Minnesota Gathering, or when people call and inquire. You know, they want to know how do you guys hire? What are you looking for? Um, requirements, hour-wise, all that. So, 
anytime we put an announcement out for a pilot, it goes through USA Jones, which is the federal hiring system. So um, kind of a pain to work with sometimes. They're trying to make it better all the time. But this is the screenshot from our last one. Um, probably hard to read there, but basically it's an open period to apply for two or two and a half weeks, depending on the time of the year. Um, GS 11, 12 positions permanent and they're in Ely. And then as you drill down in here, it tells you all the requirements, how to apply, how to submit your stuff, and then what'll happen next. So uh, these are the requirements for the GS 11, 12 pilot positions that we have here. So 1500 hours total time, 500 hours pilot in command, need a commercial uh, rating with an instrument uh, ticket or an ATP call, 50 hours of pilot in command, flying instruments, 75 hours pilot in command at night. And then the biggie for us is 500 hours on floats. So it actually used to be a thousand hours on floats and a hundred of that had to be in, you know, something similar or in a beaver. Um, and that's just because, um, you know, you didn't want somebody with nothing but, you know, J3 time coming in. Not that, not that they couldn't fly, but the, I guess in the past they may have had some issues with that. So um, with the, with the difficulty in hiring, hiring pilots lately, they've actually gone down to 500 hours. So that's the minimum we use now. Uh, tailwheel endorsement is required because it's a tailwheel airplane. We do like to see some ski time, but it's not required. Uh, it's really nice that folks have their CFIs, uh, but again, that's not required. And then we also look pretty hard at folks that have uh, part 135 experience, um, but again, that's not required. What is required is you have to begin work by the time you're 37. And that's because uh, the positions are fall under the firefighter retirement system. And firefighters have to retire at age 57. So in order to be invested in the system, you have to put 20 years in. So that means you have to start work by age 37. So there is a waiver process. And uh, that's what I got. If you're a veteran, you can actually have that waived. So, and just as an interesting note, most of the pilots who've flown here in the last 20 or 30 years have all had some sort of Alaska experience. So uh, whether it's flying 135 up there or for another federal agency or you know single pilot doing something um most everybody here has, has been up to the, the the great land not that that's required but it's looked down pretty highly so uh like i said steve covered a lot of this but i, I just want to talk about this real quick so um how did i get here well I, I grew up having beaver fever so we we used to vacation up on lake of the woods in northwest ontario and our camp was right across from a float plane base and there were beavers and Cessnas and every kind of float plane coming and going. And as you can see, every time one came to the dock, we were crawling all over it. That, that guy probably had us pumping the floats there because he was so tired of us. Um, and so we would actually, my grandpa would spring for a flight or two every year. And it, if you can see that little porthole, that's me in there, you know, kind of looking out going, man, I want, this is what I want to do for a living. You know, I want to fly beavers. So so how do you do that? If, if you grow up wanting to do that, what do you do? Well, you obviously you join the Navy for 22 years. Well, little, uh, little sidetrack, but uh, there's just a collage of the stuff. These, these airplanes on the, uh, the orange and white ones are, are the training airplanes. So the T-34, the T-2, TA-4, and then you get your wings of gold. On the fleet, I flew the EA-6B Prowler. I got lucky enough to be selected to go to the Navy's test pilot school, flew the T-38 and the T-2 again. And then as a developmental test pilot, flew the F-18. I was also a landing signal officer uh, for a bunch of my career, so I uh, got a lot of non-skid in my hair, and, and my hearing is not very good anymore. So so while that was going on, I was still kind of holding the dream of uh, when I'm done with this, doing the bush pile thing. So um, I got my float rating. I was stationed north of Seattle in Whidbey Island, so I got went down to Kenmore Air Harbor and got my float rating there. Got my tailwheel endorsement um, at the Navy Flying Club, and basically just kind of flew as much as I could in my off time. So. Uh, this is the nicest airplane, not just Beaver, but the nicest airplane I've ever had the opportunity to fly. It's way too nice to be a Beaver, uh, but it's a, it's a personal airplane of a, a gentleman in Seattle, and I was I was buddies with his corporate pilot, so he would let me fly that a little bit. Uh, the test pilot school actually had two Beavers and an Otter on wheels, so I got to fly those there. My last assignment was up in Alaska, so the first thing I did was buy a Super Cub uh, on floats and flew floats, wheels, and skis, and tried to fly the wings off it to, to get as much experience as I could. I also flew the Beaver with uh, Alaska Civil Air Patrol right there out of uh, Elmendorf at, in Anchorage, uh, which believe it or not, they had a hard time finding people to fly that. So I thought it was kind of a no brainer to get some time. So uh, lucky enough that I had a, uh, a good friend, Crystal Branchod, who uh, knew the chief pilot at Russ and uh, got me in the door there and, and got me an interview and I was able to get hired by them. Flew a, uh, 
flew a summer with them right before I retired. And then uh, Jennifer and I and Yuli, well, actually, we didn't have Yuli then. Jennifer and I moved to Kodiak for two years and uh, got to fly the Beaver for Andrew Airways and uh, really, really learned a lot down there. Had a good buddy named Willie Fulton, uh, kind of a famous bush pilot. And he, he really schooled me on the finer points of not just bush flying, but flying the Beaver as well. So I was really lucky for that. So I put all those things together and that's how I was uh, able to apply for and then ultimately be selected to come up here and fly these areas. Okay, man wise. So we we're manned year round. So we have we're supposed to have three full time pilots. We have two right now, and we've hired a third one. She should be here sometime in May. We're hoping, and hopefully we'll get her trained up pretty quick. So we have a full time A and P with his IA, and uh, one of the pilots is also an A and P. So and we all help out all the time on the airplanes whenever we. We just uh, a couple months ago hired a full-time seaplane based facility manager, which has been a huge help. Somebody after all the the day-to-day -day stuff as far as paying the bills, um, scheduling inspections on the hangar door, the hoists, all that kind of stuff. And then we do have a seasonal ramper um, that works from May to August. So you saw her in that picture before fueling the airplane, and that just happens to be my lovely wife Jennifer who gets to work over here. So that's a good deal. This is the uh, this is the current facility as we have it. These are the, we have two of these carts for pulling the airplanes out on floats. We used to use a hoist back here on the wall, but it was such a pain because we had to run it all the way out. We recently um, purchased a, a, a small John Deere tractor, which we're able to move these things around a lot easier with and a lot quicker. So uh, as you can see, we can actually get two airplanes on floats on these tractors in the hangar. I'm sorry, on these uh, carts in the hangar at once. And we, we end up doing that a couple times a summer when we know that there's a, a, a big blow or some hail or something coming through. We'll, we'll try and get them in the, both in the, in the hangar and then we'll take the third one and we'll put it in the slip and tie it down real well just to kind of protect it. So I've been told that if we needed to, we could get all three airplanes on wheels in the hangar. I'm not sure I believe that, but there are markings on the floor. So I guess somebody tried it at one point. So I'll have to see if that's true or not. Okay, this is the meat of it, the current operation. So primarily, um, you know, all the airplanes from day one were here for wildland fire. So there's four missions that we do um, every, you know, basically this time of year through the fall, depending on the weather and when things start getting wet and snow starts falling. So we do detections or we call them fire patrols. And these are just standard routes on the forest. That, and we're basically flying around and we're looking for smoke. And what we do is we fly those usually in the afternoon when the relative humidities get, get low. And when we spot a smoke, uh, we'll go take a look at it. We'll call it into our dispatch and we'll make a recommendation. We can, you know, we do what's called a size up where we tell them, give them a location, uh, rough size. We tell them what kind of timber it's burning in, uh, which way the wind's going, spread potential, are there structures around, all that kind of stuff. And then they make a decision about what they want us to do. So if it's, Somewhere close where uh, some firefighters, you know, can get into it either via vehicle or if it's in the boundary waters, if they could paddle in, um, they're probably just going to tell us to continue on the route. But if it's a fire that has a lot of spread potential or there's either a structure or some people in danger, uh, then they're probably going to tell us to move to the next phase, which is suppression. And that's going to be scooping and dropping water via the, the 125 gallon water tank. The way we do that is anytime we're on floats, the water tank is installed on the airplane. The scoop, however, is carried in the back seat, and we only put that on when we actually scoop and drop. So if they want us to do that, we go find a, a lake that's big enough. We land out in the middle and shut down, get out, attach that tube, which I'll show you here in a second, and then we'll take back off and we'll start scooping and dropping water until either the firefighter can get there or, or a bigger tanker asset can get there or we put it out. So. If we get a big fire and we've scooped and dropped on it and we're just not being effective or it's it's too big before we get there, uh, we'll transition to firefighter transport. So what this involves is we're trying to get as many firefighters as we can, as close as we can to the fire as quickly as possible. So we typically will take two firefighters with their gear, with their gear, we'll strap a canoe on the side uh, and then we'll take them in. So their gear is gonna be uh, pumps, hoses, gasoline, um, you know, tools, picks, Pulaski's, shovels, all that kind of stuff, you know, backpacks, radios, and we'll jam the airplane full of that. And then we'll, we'll find the lake as close as we can to the fire and we'll land out in the middle again, shut down, 
uh, the pilot will get out, untie the canoe, roll it in the water, and then just tie it back onto the front. The firefighters will get out and get in the canoe, and then the pilot will just start handing them their stuff. They'll load the canoe up, and then they'll paddle into the fire. And then the airplane will come back, and we'll just shuttle as many people in as they want us to. So the firefighters will typically paddle themselves back out, um, although we can go in and get them. Um, and any time that there's firefighters out doing firework on the forest or in the boundary waters, we're always kind of on call in case somebody gets hurt to go get them. And then the last fire mission that we do is prescribe for support. So uh, I've got a little slide on that here, but uh, I'll talk about that here in a second. So this is our East Fire Patrol on the Superior. The hangar right here is Shagawa, and we basically just make a counterclockwise uh, uh, route. And at each of these points, we basically make a 360 just to look behind us in case something has started. So we're basically looking for uh, campfires that haven't been put out or fires that have been set intentionally. There are some railroad lines. So if, if the engine or one of the cars or is dragging a brake and it's throwing sparks, you know, that can happen. Highways, the same thing can happen with vehicles if they're dragging a chain or something. Uh, or lightning strikes is the other big one. So uh, basically fly this route, make those 360s and then come back. So this route takes about an hour and a half to fly. And we'll fly it up at four above 4,000 feet to stay out of the prohibited areas. If the ceiling's down below that, we can get permission to fly it below 4,000, but we try and we try and stay above 4,000 as much as we can. This is the West Patrol on the Superior. It's another counterclockwise one, uh, starts up, heads up towards the border, out towards the Western area of the forest, comes back towards the coast and then back up to the hangar. This is about a two hour route. If we're in the situation where we only have a single pilot on duty or a single airplane, we can actually combine these two routes. We'll put a little extra fuel in, and that's usually about a four hour flight. We also fly these over on the Chippewa in the springtime, We're doing those right now. So uh, there's just a single route there because it's a smaller forest. This is a quick history of the water bombing tank. So back in the, the mid 50s, uh, the folks here at the base started experimenting with it. Um, they put uh, some experimental scoops on a, on a boat with an outboard and ran them around the bay just to see what angle, what uh, depth, all that kind of stuff worked to force the water in and up out the tank. Um, and then what they did is they took some old uh, fish docking tanks that they had and they started in the Norseman and they put those inside the cabin and then ran the tube up to it and then filled that up in the cabin and then dropped it out the camera hatch which the Norseman also had. And then they did the same thing with the beaver. While they were doing that, de Havilland actually developed their own um, water bombing system, and it consisted of a tank on top of each of the floats that rolled sideways and dropped water, and it had a similar scoop to fill them. Our Beaver 2, when it showed up, actually had these tanks, and, and I think they were taken off right away and, and not even used because, because they were pretty close to developing the one that they wanted to. So I've got a picture of that one right there. The current tank that we have was, was produced in the early 60s. It's actually a fuel tank from an F-87, and it's suspended under the center line. And what that does is that frees up the floats um, so you can carry external loads uh, if you need to. And it also frees up the inside so the tank is not in the, uh, in the cabin. It has six spring-loaded doors underneath, and I'll show you the picture of that. And then, like I talked about, the pickup tube gets attached to the right float, and it's removable. And then to control those doors, there's a control handle in the cockpit that the pilot actuates. So this is the de Havilland with the, these are called the uh, roll tanks, one on each side. You can see the pickup tubes there, one for each one that go down into the water. And then the tanks basically just roll, dump the water, and then uh, when they're empty, they return to that position uh, by the stream. And there it is dumping. This is our current tank. Uh, so you can see the three doors on each side. Um, and the, the big challenge with this was designing it so that those doors cleared the float spreader bars, the flying wires, and they were able to attach up where the float struts are. If you see, there's a, there's a hole right here where the cursor is. That's where the pickup tube actually sits on top. Excuse me. And then there's a clamp that goes over here, and then it's uh, bolted on down here on the float under the water. Here's a picture with the tube on. Uh, you can see the, the end of the tube under the water there, and then the clamp that holds it down. Uh, the other thing that you can't see is uh, on the other side here is another cutout and on the left strut is a mirror that's positioned so the pilot can look at that hole and when he sees the sees white foam coming out of it he knows that the tank is full and that's when he can turn it back off so uh, just some photos here of when they were designing it there was some really uh really talented and kind of ingenious folks working here back in the 50s and 60s so 
they took that fuel tank and uh, cut it apart and put some mechanisms here, cut and, and riveted the doors in uh, and made it work. And, and more importantly, got it approved to fly on the airplane. So they experimented with several different types of pickup tubes. I think this is probably the first one, which is kind of a flat, it looks like a strut. So it was a flat tube. And then this, you can see there's a hose clamp there. So this is a, a some sort of flexible tube. I think this is the same one that goes up and it actually got stuffed in the top there. Uh, some different size tubes that they experimented with, some different configurations and curves. And then they even, that's, that's that first one I think that they experimented with. And then they even experimented with putting two tubes into one tank so you can see them both there. And then what they settled on is this one, which is the one we use today. This is basically just a three inch steel uh, exhaust pipe and it's got a couple of 90 degrees uh, welded on it and then a bracket down here. So there's a, basically a stud on that little bracket on the, uh, on the floats and this fits right over it and then just uh, gets tightened down with a nut. This is the handle in the cockpit uh, right in front of the pilot, so right under the pilot's right leg. So up means the doors are closed and then when you're ready to drop the water, you basically slap that and it goes down, the doors open, the water drops. So. This is an overhead shot of a, of a drop on a, a fire next to a road. You can see the fire engine there. And then this is kind of the, the money shot that we have. So the, the interesting thing about um, scooping and dropping water is it's very unnatural um, if you're a pilot to do it. So you put the tube, you shut down like we talked about, put the tube on. And then when you go to take off, you have to leave the doors open because you'll never get off the water because there's too much drag and too much weight if the doors are open. So you actually leave the, leave the doors open and then you either take off and close the doors and then come around and scoop. Or once you get up on step, then you can close the door and fill it up and take off. But the, the process is you come around for a touch and go, you land and the uncomfortable part is you actually have to let the pressure, the back pressure on the yoke off to kind of get the floats to dig in is what it feels like, but it's really the, the tube. Um, and that's when you know you're scooping water. If you never get that grab, you're just gonna go down and you're never gonna fill the tank up. So once that starts happening, then you have to bring the power up enough where you keep that attitude, but you don't lose it. And in about six or seven seconds, you're watching that mirror and you're, you're gonna see the water foaming out and you know the tank's full and then the fun really begins. So when that happens, you go to, to full power and then you actually cross control the airplane to get it off the water. So you have to go, Pull left yoke and you're trying to get the uh, the tube on the right float here up out of the water and then you put the yoke all the way back in your back or all the way back in your lap to try and get into ground effect but while you're doing that the airplane starts turning to the left usually towards the shore and so you have to apply full right rudder so you've got a full cross control and the yoke back in your lap and you're just trying to yank the thing into ground effect um, it obviously gets easier the lighter you get, but when you're heavy, it can be real bare to get the airplane off. And then even once you're off, um, you're kind of wallowing there for a little bit until you can build some speed up. So uh, you have to make sure you pick a lake that's big enough, um, and then you have to look at the obstacles again. The good thing is you've always gotten out if, if you're not climbing like you do. You just dump the load of water and you jump right up, and then you're a normal airplane again. So um, It's fun teaching it. It's fun doing it. And then when you go to drop the water, you, there's usually somebody on the ground, but not always. So you, you kind of pick your spot, come around and we target about hundred feet over the canopy. And uh, you just, uh, you time it so that you're trying to hit the base of the fire, usually not the tops of the trees. And then you just slap that handle down and that water comes out, close it up, and then you go back and do it again. So depending on how close the lakes are to where the fire is, you can actually be dropping water every you know, like three or four minutes if it's close enough. So. And if you get a couple of them together, you can actually keep a, a pretty stream of water on a fire. So, so hey, Hanny, so yeah, so that's a so that's about a thousand pounds of water in my rough yeah, calculation. Exactly. So yeah, exactly. So what's the but but the useful load of the plane is significantly more than that. But you just can't deal with it if it's that much weight below there, rather than yeah, to have a bigger tank. Right. So if you go out with full fuel tanks and a and a normal size pilot and you scoop that 125 gallons, you're actually out of the forward CG. So when we do it, we, we do a couple things. So we sometimes we will not take a full load if we're going on a fire patrol. And usually when we come back from something, we don't fuel the airplanes right away. We leave them where they're at. And that's so that if we get called for a fire, we're at a lighter weight. Or if we get called to go into a small lake for a 
a medevac or something like that, we're at a lighter weight. So yeah, the, the, um, the gross weight, you know, it, it helps us with the big loads, but that where that load sits in the CG kind of limits what we can put in there. So we're, we're restricted to having only the pilot in there when we scoop and drop water, unless we're training and then we can have two pilots in, which is another reason why um, sometimes the, the detection flights, like if they're by a contractor, they have to carry a forest service observer with them, somebody who's trained on fire and stuff. We don't do that because if, if we see a fire and they want us to scoop on it, then we have to land and put them on an island or something and then go scoop and then we have to go back and get them. So we fly the fire patrols all by ourselves. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a good question. We have to keep real close eye on FTG when we're doing that. So this is, uh, so like I talked about, if, if we get a big fire and they want a bunch of firefighters in there, this is uh, what we transition to. So you can see see the packs, the fuel for the, for the saws, if they're taking chainsaws in, uh, camping gear, their helmets, all that kind of stuff. Um, and we talked about, you know, taking two of them in and uh, just getting them as close as we can. So, and we'll run, We'll run these all day if we need to, to get as many folks in there as we can. This, if you look here, here's actually the, uh, that's the beaching gear for the beaver sitting over there on the end of the uh, end of the pier. And like I said, we still have those today. We don't use them, but we could if we need them. So. Uh, I talked about, uh, we have had the, the Alaska beaver right here, 106 Fox, Foxtrot Sierra come down. I'm not sure which fire this was. I think it was back in the mid 2000s, but uh, since that one couldn't have the water bombing tank on it, it did a lot of the firefighter transport, but it also did a lot of the media flights and VIP flights because they wanted to see the fire and see how it was going and yada, yada, yada. So, but that was, that was a big help to have that fourth airplane and that fourth pilot here because those, those days get pretty long during those uh, summer months. Are those tanks approved only for those particular airplanes? Yep, that's correct. And, and it, that goes into a, a different question that people sometimes ask is, why do we, why do we still use the beavers? You know, why don't we either put turbine engines on them or just get Kodiaks or just get fire bosses or whatever. And part of the problem is uh, we would lose a whole bunch of missions if we went to something else. So um, just like you said, Laura, that those tanks are marked beaver one, beaver two, beaver three, and the three, three, seven for those mods says that tank goes on that airplane and that airplane only. And so yeah. if we ever do that, I mean, you can imagine trying to get that kind of thing through the FAA today. I mean, I, I don't even want to think about having to try to do that. Fortunately, it was done back in the 60s when they probably had a, somebody up from the cities and look at it and said, yeah, that looks pretty good. Here's your paperwork, you know? So um, yeah, good question. Okay, so the last one here is uh, prescribed burns. So the reason uh, the Forest Service does these, well, not just Forest Service, other folks do them too, but the reason they're done is um, to reduce the amount of hazardous fuels that are uh, laying on the forest floor, and that lowers the potential for some of those high intensity wildland fires if they can get rid of some of those. Uh, it also restores fire as an ecosystem protecting process. Um, they can either be lit by hand, so the, the firefighters will walk around with a drip torch and just drop fire on and set it going, or by uh, helicopter, which is, uh, which is pretty cool actually. There's a, a red dragon system is what it's called. And uh, this system ejects these ping pong ping pong ball size spheres uh, out the door to set the, the ground on fire. So the spheres have potassium permanganate in them and right before the machine, right before that sends them out the door, it injects a needle with ethylene glycol or antifreeze into it. And then about 30 seconds later, it starts to combust and it'll burn for about 80 seconds. So here's a picture of one over on the, the chippo on some of the grasslands. And if you look close, you can see these where there's individual spots and then you can see little curves here. So the helicopter basically came along and just dropped those. And then after about a minute, you just see a little black spot and some smoke and then it starts to burn and eventually they all come together to form the head of the fire here and it just kind of works its way down. So kind of a cool system. Um, what we do when, when we're supporting these is we're reporting on uh, how high and what direction the smoke is going and how far it's traveling. We're watching um, because they set up, you know, burn lines like this uh, road or this gully here, then this fence or this uh, tree line right here. That's as far as they want it to go. So we'll orbit around and look and see if, hey, is something jumped there and it's starting to burn in here or, um, you know, something is burning past the burn line over here. We'll let them know. And then we can land and take firefighters up so they can see it from the air and get a better idea of how well they're doing. This is another one on the Chippewa done in springtime. Obviously we still got ice on there, but that makes a real nice barrier. So you can see, you know, they're starting over past here and working all the way over here. So that was actually a really, really big 
uh, wetland burn that they do there, I think every two or three, three or four years, something like that. And then here's one in, uh, in actually the wooded area and they, they actually still do um, the aerial ones in there. And the reason is that there's potential when you get in here to actually, when, you're, when you have folks down there uh, using the drip torches to have it flare up and they could actually be you know trapped in between a line and this stuff. So it's much better to have those set aerially, so. Okay, uh, another big thing that we do usually during the summer is a uh, combination of ocean rescue, medevac, law enforcement, and unfortunately some body recovery flights. So we have the Forest Service has a standing agreement with the sheriffs of the three counties that, uh, that the boundary waters fall under uh, to provide search and rescue and medevac on the, on the Superior National Forest. So those counties are St. Louis, Lake, and, and Cook. And the way that works is anytime there's any kind of uh, situation where somebody is uh, missing or somebody calls because they're hurt, um, the sheriff has the responsibility to go to go in and get them. And they don't technically even have to ask the Forest Service, they can go do whatever they want. They will usually call us first, especially if it's in the boundary waters, because they know uh, that we almost always have somebody here, we know the area and we can get in and out pretty quickly. So. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a second. The law enforcement stuff includes taking sheriffs in, Forest Service law enforcement officers, and then we also have done some stuff with Customs and Border Protection folks where we run the run the borders a lot during the winter, actually looking for folks, you know, on snowmobiles going into Boundary Waters or coming across the border illegally or something like that. <coughs> Excuse me. We do average about one body recovery uh, from the Boundary Waters a year, and um, Usually it's either a, a drowning, a heart attack, or a stroke, um, something like that. So um, not, a, not a pleasant thing, but something that, uh, that we do. So this is what a medevac usually looks like. Um, we'll get a call and uh, we'll wait for an EMT. They'll show up, we'll put them in the airplane. Uh, we'll fly out to find the person. We'll let the EMT off. We'll, we'll get the airplane position to leave. The, the EMT will treat them, load them up in the airplane, and then we'll fly them back, transfer them to the uh, transfer them to the ambulance and then they'll take them to the local hospital here. So search and rescues are usually, you know, somebody has left a, a plan and they, they're they overdue or they're uh, maybe they'll set a spot or an in-reach off or something like that. Uh, so we'll usually be given a rough location and we'll go out to try and find them. This is a gentleman in the, in the boundary waters. It was about three days overdue and um, he was actually pretty smart. He, he, he knew he couldn't hike anymore. So he took his red sleeping bag and he laid it out right on the shore in a square. And uh, as, as I was flying over, I actually saw it and then I saw him. So uh, I didn't have a law enforcement officer with me this time because I was doing something else. And they just told me, so I actually just parked the airplane and walked over and got him in his gear and, and brought him out. So, and then medevacs, um, we, we treat those kind of like um, air ambulances do. So our dispatch gets the call from the sheriff. I'm gonna turn this on. Look like a ghost. Anyway, um, our dispatchers get a call from the sheriff and then the sheriff will call us and they'll just simply say, we, we've got a medevac request uh, and it's on this lake, can you do it? And the theory is, you know, they don't wanna put pressure on us by saying, you know, it's a four-year-old kid who's gonna die if you don't go or something like that. So basically our response is, yep, we've got a pilot who's got plenty of, of duty time left. We've got an up airplane, the weather's good. We can go do it, give me the details. So then, then we go through the process of getting an EMT and going to do it. A lot of these tend to happen um, on portages. So this young lady lay in her broken leg and you can see that this portage is actually really tight. You know, they're not made to park airplanes in. So we end up having to stuff the tail in the, uh, in the trees quite a bit. And um, fortunately, you know, it's a rugged airplane. But, so the EMT will treat them and then we'll, uh, you know, help them get out here and then we'll take them back like we talked about. Uh, in the past, they've done some uh, training with the FBI where um, they were doing some kind of cold weather exercise. Uh, I'm not sure if they're in the boundary. I don't think they're in the boundary waters, probably just in the forest. Um, and so they brought a bunch of folks up and uh, the pilots here took them in on, uh, on skis and dropped them off. So that was, a, that was a good training opportunity for everybody there. Uh, one of the other missions we do is forest health. We basically fly grid lines over both the Superior and the Chip, and then also over Isle Royal out there uh, off the in the Lake Superior. And what the, what the gentleman on the right seat's looking for is he's mapping uh, for insect disease and weather event disturbances on the floor, on the forest. And uh, basically it just helps facilitate how they manage the forest. So we do those every year, like clockwork right around the 4th of July. And uh, this is what it looks like. It's actually, 
it's kind of mind numbing, although you have to concentrate because the guy really wants you to be right on that, uh, that line, you know, that line that he wants. And then we get to the end. Okay. Go five miles to the south. Okay. Go back the other way. You know, so you just end up doing this over and over and it's usually when it's hot and bumpy out. So it's not a super enjoyable flight, but Hey, Haney. Yeah, go ahead. Somebody wanted to know regarding search and rescue. Is there, does yep. the CAP fly up there as well too? Uh, there is not a CAP close enough for us to do that. I'm not, I'm not even sure where the closest one is. There's probably one down in the cities, but um, we're, we're the primary ones to go do that for this area. Then there's been times where um, I was the only pilot here for a couple of years. And so, you know, I can work 12 days and then I have to have two days off. And um, if something happened during that time, they'll either go to one of the local flow plane guys There's still a couple here and they'll see if they can do it or they'll see if there's uh, if the state can go in in uh, like their 185 on floats um, or worst case, they'll bring a, a state helicopter up from the cities, which is kind of ridiculous. But um, yeah, we don't we don't do much CAP or have much CAP interaction up there. Okay, uh, wildlife sur surveys and telemetry. So we got uh, over 35 year history of support in the USGS. Uh, they have a wolf and deer study that's been going on for, I wanna say like 60 years up there. So they, uh, they trap and collar uh, wolves and deer here with GPS and VHF collars, and then we go out and track them. So in the summer, we're typically just getting location only because we're never going to see them in the in the trees. But in the winter, they then we're looking for location, health, pack size, whatever, because we routinely see the animals down on the snow and on the ice. Uh, we also do beaver surveys in the fall because those are uh, those are our main source of food for the wolves, and then uh, the bald eagle surveys in the spring. So when we do wolf telemetry, we put these two uh, antennas on the airplane and then we put the biologist in the right seat and uh, she carries this box on the left and then she has that splitter on the right. And so she basically dials the frequency of the animal in here and then she's got gain and volume and some other stuff. And she can put multiple frequencies in and scan and then she can stop on when she hears a strong one. And then basically she just goes from both to left to or right to left and keeps going back and forth. And she's kind of using that to localize or, or figure out where the animal is. And because she has to unplug her headset um, to plug in here, then uh, she can't hear us. So she uses, I can hear her, the pilot can hear her, but she can't hear us. So she uses hand signals and, and of course she can talk to, you know, come left, whatever, but usually she just, she's concentrating so hard that she just gives hand signals like go straight, you know, go that way. Okay, start in orbit this way, whatever. And so we basically just, you know, once she finds that circle where it's always strongest on one side, then she's pretty sure that that animal is in that circle. Then we'll start tightening the circle up and we'll start descending. We can go down to 500 feet to go see, see the animal. So, um, the hey, Nate, we got it. We got another, we got another question. We got a guy with his hand up. Vincent, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I, I did SAR work in Yosemite in the seventies and we had a tremendous amount of military support out of Castle and Lamore, mm -hmm. uh, primarily uh, the choppers, the Hueys. So uh, my question is, do you have military support and do you have helicopters in support? We, we don't typically, um, other than that odd occasion, like I talked about where there's nobody here, uh, the closest military base, well, there's, there's an air guard base in Duluth, but they fly F-16, so there's no helicopters there. The closest <laughs> active duty military base is in uh, North Dakota, which is quite a ways away. And yeah. to be quite honest, one of the reasons why they prefer us to go in is that they're very sensitive about the wilderness area. And so when we can go in and find somebody, we can go in high, find out where they are, pull the power back to idle, circle down and land, pick the person up and then make one takeoff and be gone. Whereas a helicopter who's going, even if he's up high, is gonna be making a lot of noise. And, and so they're very, very conscious about the noise level and disturbing people's wilderness experience. So that's that's one of the reasons why we do it. Now we do have, for fire season, they do helicopters up that like the type one and two helicopters, you know, that can uh, put the snorkel in the water, the Chinooks and the right. sky and that. And if there's a fire, then, you know, all bets are off, they're gonna, they're going to send those in, but yeah, usually they like to, to minimize the amount of noise we create in there. Can I ask one more question before I go? Sure. Uh, how much water are you actually carrying on those planes? 
So it's 125 gallons will go in that tank. So about a thousand, a thousand pounds. So it's really only effective on smaller fires or if we're trying to just kind of hold a line until the firefighters can get there or something. So yeah, it's if it's a big fire, we're going to be, we're going to be really ineffective. Yep. You're really just spots. That's yep. You're exactly. Doing. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, hey, hey, Kenny, we got one more question here. Sure. Um, uh, somebody wanted to know if Minnesota has a state forest service and if so, how do they interact with the forest service, the U.S. forest service? They do have state forests here, I think, and I would have to double check on this. I think they all fall under the Minnesota DNR, Department of Natural Resources. So we, we work very closely with them for, for several different things. They, they'll fly for, uh, fire missions for us, like air attack missions, like controlling the, the fire. Um, we'll, we'll fly some transport missions for them. They'll fly some for us. We, we card them. In other words, we we inspect their pilots and their planes so they can fly for the forest service. So th there's a good relationship with the DNR. I don't, I've never heard of an actual, um, you know, designated state forest service that's separate from the DNR, I guess is what I'm saying. Okay. All right. So back to telemetry, we talked about the box here and then uh, finding the, finding the animal. Here's just some, some pictures. A lot of the time what we look, excuse me, what we look for in the winter is, uh, this is a kill site, probably a moose, and you can see there's one, two, three, and I think that might be one, so four, four wolves around that. So if you can find one of those sites that's relatively fresh, you, there's bound to be some wolves either hanging out near it or just sitting there still eating on it. So that's always a good sign. And, and you know, it's gonna be, there's gonna be a bunch of red blood around it when it's fresh and that's gonna turn brown and then it's black so you can kind of tell whether it's and, and obviously if there's nothing left then their wolves are gone because they've taken care of it so um, we look for those a lot um, in the winter the the wolves when the sun's out they like to sit on the north side of the uh, the north shore you know and face into the the south sun and then lay there and sleep so that's a good spot to look um, and then you know sometimes they make it easy they they actually walk across the lake in, in their packs and so you get a real good count and uh, you can see their colors and Sometimes if you're lucky, you can get, get a reflection off the one that has the collar on it. So you can tell that that's the one that you're crafting. So. And then this is my favorite picture. I took this. Sometimes they make it incredibly easy. They, they make a single set of tracks out. They lay down and they go halfway back and then they lay down there. So that, that one's pretty easy to find. Although it, it took about four passes to get the shadow of the airplane right over it to get a good picture of it. So anyway, that's wolf telemetry is fun. And um, uh, it's more fun in the winter than it is in the summer. Okay, the tree cedar, we talked about that. I showed you the picture. So that's basically uh, trying to restock areas that have been harvested. So we load that thing up with seeds and uh, we check it before we take off. It, again, it plugs into the aux power and then has the auger there. So um, once we get out, uh, we'll, we'll fly about 40 foot wide strips at 80 miles an hour down 50 feet. And uh, as soon as we get over the area where they want the seeds, we'll turn it on, fly a run. And then we get to the end, turn it off, go out, make a teardrop, come back and do the same thing. So we can do about a 40 acre plot in 10 to 15 minutes. And the nice thing is, is we can do multiple plots with different seeds during the same flight. So typically they'll give us, you know, maybe a half a dozen areas that they want seeded and they might, want, you know, uh, jack pine in one and spruce in the other and different amounts or whatever. So they'll just give us different bags with the seeds in. And so when you're done with one, you just climb up, trim the airplane up, and then you just reach back, open the bag and dump it in the, in the hopper. And then you go to the next one. So primarily jack pine and spruce, like I said. Uh, it's a lot of fun to fly that low and, and, um, and get down there in the trees and do that. There's, there's a better picture of the hopper. You got the motor here, and then the, uh, the belt-driven uh, auger is in there. There's a mirror. We like to use mirrors. It goes on the back here, so when you look back, you can actually aim the mirror down at the bottom so you can see when you're out of seed. Uh, and then probably the most important thing is you have a box in the front that has the controls, but in that box is, is a, like a big half inch dowel that's about two feet long. And after every run, you grab that and you whack the hopper because if the, the seeds get wet, they, they'll stick. And so you gotta make sure that they're still flowing. So you bang that thing a couple of times and then it, it keeps running. So there's just a photo from somebody on the ground. And the, the way we know, like I said, we test it before we go out, but the way we know it's in the air is there's always a forest service, uh, either a timber person or a, a ranger or somebody on the ground with a radio that we're talking to. And once we get eyes on them, we have them stand right in the middle and we come over 
jumping seeds. And if they hear the seeds hitting their helmet and they feel them, then we know we're good. So they'll say, yep, we feel it, you're good. And so then we'll commence and do the, do the rest of the run. Okay, we talked about supporting the Minnesota DNR. A lot of what we do is their fishery stuff. So we have that internal fish tank. Um, so we can, we can land and release the fish. And I've got a picture of that, which is uh, you know, usually pretty easy on them. And we can also uh, stock them from the air. So if they're small lakes, they're too small to get into. And if they're the correct size fry, then we actually let them out in the air. The other thing we do for the, the DNR for fisheries is uh, take a couple of their biologists in uh, on lake surveys. So they take two biologists and an 18 square foot, uh, 18 foot square stern canoe tied onto the float. And then they have these uh, usually six to eight of these 250 foot experimental gill nets. And these, these things are heavy when they're dry. And when we come back and they're wet, they are miserable. Um, so we take those and then they have an outboard motor and gas and usually enough supplies for about a four or five day trip in there. So we drop them off usually on a, on a Monday and then pick them up on a late on a Friday or on a Saturday to pick them back, bring them out. So uh, this is how they do it. We get the tank installed in the airplane and then they back the tanker truck right up. Uh, they'll fill it up with water from the, the tanker so that they don't you know, shock the fish. And then they'll just start loading them in with five gallon buckets and they weigh them all and then they, they segregate them in. And this is almost like the, the, the tree seeding hopper. You can put different species in these different compartments and you can go drop the first two or even that just that one and one like go to a next one and drop a different one. So um, it's a pretty ingenious thing. These hoses are the, the aeration tubes. So they turn those on with the oxygen to keep the fish alive and then throw a net over it for when we're flying so the fish don't bounce out and end up out here. So, um, and then the, the way we do it is you, if you're gonna do it, well, if you're gonna do it while you're sitting on the water, then you can do it by yourself. So um, there's a splash some water on the lens here, but so this is the bottom half of the, the hopper where the cursor is there. And the trick with this is if you just open that wide open, all the fish come down and hit the tail end of the, the water bombing tank and kind of get stunned. They just barely crack them and then they kind of slide off the end and they most of them will miss it here. And that's kind of the, the general way to do it. If you're- Hey, Penny, somebody wanted to know uh, while you're talking there, do you have issues with corrosion or how do you combat corrosion given all these kind of- You know, we, um, we, we keep the airplanes pretty clean, but since we, we never go in salt water, we don't have a real big um, problem with it, but we do, there's a, there's a, relatively new kind of extensive, extensive corrosion program for the beavers uh, and the otters actually um, that you have to do every annual. So we take a real good look at them, but we don't, it's not something that we really have to deal with. We actually have to deal more with keeping things clean because of the, the iron content in the water up here tends to clean the floats and some of the, the parts that get wet. So, but corrosion is not a real big deal. So uh, like I said, if it's a small lake, well, we can also drop them from the air. So we get down about you know, 100 feet or so. Um, and if you're doing this, then you have to have somebody in the back and that person is opening the door and then opening the different hatches to let all the, uh, let them all out. And you can see them kind of gently dropping in the water there. This is a, a GoPro image. Um, there's, the, there's the hopper open. And then you can just see the fish kind of they go out and it looks like an explosion and then they kind of streamline and then just kind of gently hit in the water. And, and we've been asked a lot about survival rate and the, and the DNR biologists say it's actually really good. So um, that's why they do it this way. And then there's just uh, carrying one of the square stern uh, canoes for the, uh, for the survey one. So you can kind of get a, a, an idea there. They, they generally load the airplane up pretty good. Uh, this is picking one of them up. So they got all their stuff laying around here. And then you can, there's, there's, you know, three of those nets and they, they just look heavy. My back hurts just looking at those right now. And then, you know, they take their coolers and, and jam it all full of stuff. So, okay, getting close to the end here. So aerial survey, um, we'll take all kinds of, of folks from the forest service up to look at timber when they're trying to let out contracts for folks to, to harvest the land, um, land use and land exchange, do quite a bit of that of exchange and forest service land for private land and back and forth. Realty when they're when they're looking at selling off a piece, you know they need to make sure that nobody's put a deer stand on it or there's a new trail through it or something like that. And then weather damage. So we seem to do quite a bit of this. You know, if we get a big storm that comes through, we get we get straight line winds up here sometimes of up to like 100 miles an hour, and they'll just level, you know, miles of trees, and that that ends up being that fuel on the floor. So whenever that happens, they really like to to go out and fly over and see uh, what's damaged and what's not. 
This is something that we don't do anymore, but it's pretty cool. I just thought I'd throw it in here. So um, paracargo mission is we used to be able to resupply the firefighters in the field. Uh, four barrels, two on each float, and then they have parachute stuffed in them. And then those switches that I showed you before, those bomb switches, uh, the pilot would just hit those and then um, they, they would roll off and then the parachute would open. So two on each side and then the wirings uh, go up into the harness and then the parachutes in the top there and then load up whatever the firefighters would need, food, water, tools, fuel, whatever. So that's how it looks taxiing out, plastic covers on them there. And then you can drop, you know, one at a time or selectively drop them, or you could drop all of them. And obviously if it, you know, go back, it's got the, got the rip cord on it that you can see there, which basically just pulls the, pulls the chute out. And that, that actually looks like he's not dropping it from very high. So that chute probably has to open pretty quick, or you can do all four of them at once and they'll come out. So, and there they are dropping down. Okay, last couple slides here. Um, some of the unique things that we do for training, we have to do you know annual check rides, and and we're kind of unique in the Forest Service since we fly fly different configurations. We have to do multiple check rides, and one of the requirements is we have to do a check ride from somebody outside of our region every year. So we have the the gentleman who flies the Alaska Beaver. He comes down twice a year, and, and we do reciprocal check rides. So. I'll check him, he'll check me, and he'll check our other pilots. So um, that works out pretty well. We keep everybody honest about flying. There, we don't have kind of like a little clicky thing about, yeah, I know you can fly. We're just going to go do it and call it a check ride or whatever. So the other unique thing we do is um, the rest of the Forest Service is required to do some kind of simulator training once a year. So the guys who fly the Kodiaks, the Twin Otters, the King Airs, that kind of stuff, they go to flight safety and they get, you know, actual training there. Well, there's, there's no train there's no simulator for the beaver so we get a set amount every every pilot here gets a set amount every year to go some kind of type specific training and so we have a whole list of things we can do and there's some really cool things so um i actually went up to anchorage and got my multi-engine sequel in the in the grum and goose at the at the goose hangar there just fantastic uh training highly recommend that and uh super nice folks there i was able to take one of our airplanes out um uh Steve, you had Lori McNichol on um, early in one of these, and we went out and uh, did a seminar with her. As a matter of fact, I think that's probably her right there on that far Kodiak. But we took two two of the Forest Service Kodiaks and then the Beaver and and flew around and beat up the Frank Church Wilderness. So that was again just just unbelievable training that we were able to do. Um, the Forest Service has a preferred vendor, this Aviation Performance Solutions, to do upset training. Uh, I haven't done that yet, but I, I definitely want to get down and do that. And then some of the other things we have are, you know, if we want to go do some ski ski training with like Don Lee up in Talkeetna, or if we want to do some advanced beaver flying with, with Kenmore out in Seattle, or, you know, just a bush pilot course, you know, there's ones all over the place. So a lot of different things that we get to do. Um, and they're, they're really unique to be able to do that. So, and I, I was able to, I, last year, instead of doing a flying thing, I was actually able to go down and finish my a &P down in Tulsa. So that was another uh, really good opportunity that the, that the Forest Service gave me. So. Okay, uh, just a few other things here and then we're done. So we have taken uh, the beaver at least once, maybe more than that, up to Alaska. Um, this is when it was on amphibs. And that was before the Region 10 beaver was actually there. So we would go up and do some, some law enforcement support for those guys. Um, we tend every year that Oshkosh happens to pull an airplane off of floats, take the tank off, put wheels on and fly it down there and, uh, and grip and grin and show off the flag. So uh, we're, we've last, the last time we were down there, they moved us from the flight line to behind one of the big pavilions. I think it's, or not pavilions, exhibit halls. I think it's exhibit hall D. So um, it's kind of the international federation partnership or something where You've got all the Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife, BLM, everybody kind of in one spot. So that's a real good place to kind of show the airplane off and uh, meet and greet people, recruit for when we need pilots, all kinds of stuff. So, uh, let's see, the, it seems like the, the Amphib airplane gets around quite a bit when we had it, but a couple of years back in the late 80s, uh, the airplane was flown in the fall to the Navy's test pilot school in Patuxent River, Maryland. And the idea was to give all the student test pilots a chance to fly a float plane and then as well as fly amphibs. So um, that was a that was a really good experience for the, the gentleman who did it. I think they did that for two or three years. And I just I just had to throw these in. So there's there's yours truly back in 1998 when I was going through test pilot school flying Beaver 3. 
And then there's a couple of days ago, 20, I don't even want to guess how many years later, but flying that same airplane, not on amphibs, obviously, but so I thought that was a cool, cool picture of that. And then, okay, this is really the last couple of slides. What's the future hold for us? So um, region nine, the Eastern region you can see here is, is a big region. There's I think 19 national forests and a, a prairie land and some ungodly amount of acres. So what we're trying to do eventually here, once we get fully manned is to branch out a little bit from just flying Ely and the Superior and the chip. So I uh, wanna to go to the UP, to Michigan proper, Wisconsin, down to the Mark Twain, uh, the Hoosier, the, uh, the Wayne National Forest in Ohio. I was actually down there last week or a couple of weeks ago for about a week flying fire patrol down there. So um, the goal there is just to kind of expand the use of the airplane throughout the region because we're, we're the only pure forest service aviation assets that region nine has. So uh, we also want to look at cooperating with our state and our other partners uh, to support all the kind of land management objectives. We've had in the past a partnership with Isle Royal out uh, off the arrowhead there to support their winter study and basically take the airplane out on skis and land it on the ice on Lake Superior and shuttle people and parts and supplies and stuff. We, we stopped doing that back when uh, the pilot who was before me was here by himself for a couple of years. And then I've been here for a couple of years up until recently. So um, we just kind of did the risk management thing and, and figured that that wasn't a real smart thing to do because if, if you know, you can't get the airplane started or you've been, been the landing gear or something, there's, there's nobody back here to come and get you. And then you're kind of stuck out there. So now that we've got pilots and airplanes, uh, we're going to try and start that up again. Uh, we're trying to work this unique partnership with Voyager yeah. National Park. They have a relatively new Cub Crafters Top Cub on amphibs. Um, unfortunately, they don't have a pilot. Well, actually, fortunately for us, they don't have a pilot. So we're, we're entering into a, a memorandum of agreement with them where our pilots are going to get qualified to fly their, their airplane in support of their missions. And in return, they're going to let us fly it for an equal number of hours for forest service missions. And we're going to base the airplane here in Ely. So that's a real good deal and a kind of a success story once we get that all in place. So hopefully that'll we'll start flying those missions by the end of the year. And I talked a little bit about aerial ignition, that Red Dragon platform. There's There's been some questions about whether we could actually do that. And it's been done in Australia for a long time, actually, where they've actually put one of those machines in the back of the beaver and, and you know, ignited those prescribed burns by by that. So we'll see if, if that happens. But the future's, future's looking bright. And there's a picture of the Top Cub which hopefully we're going to have here soon. And then this is the, uh, the, the Region 10 airplane on, on nice big 35s. And we actually have a set of those here in the, in the uh, hangar, and we're just waiting for, for permission to put them on. And then uh, hopefully we're going to start using the airplane to um, go look at some backcountry stuff out of region as well. So, And two video links. Uh, this top one, I know you probably can't click on these. I guess maybe you can if you're watching on YouTube. But you just Google USFS seaplane base. Uh, this is a video that was done, I want to say maybe 10 or more years ago. And it was done by the, the Seaplane Pilots Association. It's a really good look at uh, a lot of the stuff I talked about and a close airplane and stuff. That's Dean Lee, our pilot. And that's uh, uh, Jim McManus. Jim McManus, yeah. For some reason I thought that was Dave Quam, but anyway. Um, and then this, this one down here is just a little promo. It's like a minute long that I put out when we were trying to get people excited about coming to work here. So to Google, it's hip to fly beaver. And that is it. So there's a couple so, questions. Um, all right. First one is, uh, eventually the beaver will sadly have to be replaced with something. What aircraft would be the worthy candidate? That's your tongue, Alexander. <laughs> Well, the, the Forest Service has has already bought a couple of Kodiaks and they I think they have, they bought two, I think they have six more that they have either an option on or that we're eventually gonna buy sometime. So I think that might be a leading candidate, although you're still up? You are, I just pulled off your slide. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I know that, you know, there's varying opinions about how that works as a flow plane. And again, you know, like I said before, once we lose the beaver, we lose that, that water bombing capability and as well, probably some of the cargo hauling and the short takeoff and landing capability. So um, people have said, you know, you could get, you could get some seats and do that. Well, yeah, but then all you do is, all you're doing is dropping water and maybe doing detection flights. So you can't do search and rescue. You can't haul firefighters, all that. 
There's been studies done about getting uh, the, the otter with the turbine engine or converting these to turbines. Um, it's, it's, a tough, it's a tough nut to crack. We're, we're pretty confident that we can get these out at least another 10 to 15 years and hopefully a little beyond that. So I, I, I honestly don't have a real good answer about what the, what the best airplane is gonna be to replace these. So another question, and I know that I've asked you this six times myself, is there any chance a civilian over 37 could waive their retirement to skip the age requirement? We, we have asked that question numerous times and I, I've actually, the, the problem we have, and you, you, I'm sure everybody out there can figure it out, but you, you say, okay, you can't be over 37 because of the firefighter thing, but then we have these requirements to have a certain amount of float time. Well. You've got, the, you've got the age limit up here, and then you've got how much time it takes to get that. So you've got this real narrow pool of people that, that we're asking for. So I, just about everybody that I've, that I've talked to that has asked that question says, heck yeah, I would, I would go without a retirement, a retirement if I could do that. And we've, we've brought it up and it always just kind of gets poo-pooed because, you know, I don't want to, I, I won't badmouth any, any part of the Forest Service, but it's just, we're, you know, we fall under under fire, so they they kind of make a lot of the rules, and that's kind of a sacred thing for them. So um, yeah, it's it's really tough when it comes to finding pilots. We're fortunate that we we found a couple of young folks who have the experience and that fall into that thing. And then you know, luckily I got the waiver, so we're we're going to be fully manned here. But it's a question that's been asked and and chewed on a lot, and it just we we seem to kind of bang our heads against the wall and never get the answer that we're looking for. And you got a question from Vincent. I was just curious, is the Forest Service looking at trying to find more beavers? You know, so we actually have, in, in the past, we, we received two, two airplanes from the Wisconsin DNR or whatever they call their natural resources there. And we basically cannibalized those airplanes for parts. Right. And then later on, we received two airplanes from the North Carolina DNR. And we actually have both of those airplanes out at the Ely Airport in a hangar. Uh, one of them was wrecked, but the other one was flown here. Um, they've been sitting there for quite a while. So the theory is that if we get to a point where we need one or, or heaven forbid we, ha we have an accident where we can't use one, that we could probably rebuild one ourselves, or send it out somewhere to be rebuilt. Right. Um, I don't think we have actively gone out and looked at like, you know, a Kenmore rebuild beaver or something like that. Um, because, you know, the theory is they're probably not going to get any better than the ones that we have. Like I said, you know, <laughs> we know their whole history, but it's, it's an interesting question because it's, it's the perfect airplane for this area, you know, for the boundary waters, for the short takeoff and landing, the hauling, you know, the, there's no problem with hauling external loads, which we do a lot of because it's on the type certificate for the airplane. Um, so yeah, it's, it's going to be a, it's going to be a sad day when the decision's made to get rid of them, but hopefully we keep proving our worth and, and, you know, keep, keep doing a good job and, and we keep them around as long as we can. They're so versatile. Yep. They really are really are. Well, Joel, Henny, this was awesome. And Smokey Bear looks kind of creepy over your shoulder, I got to tell you. you <laughs> be able to, it's kind of really probably turn the light on. Yeah, Smokey Bear looking over your shoulder like some sort of, I don't know <laughs> what, but thank you so much. This was really great and appreciate your time. Let's see if we have any, so it might be one more question. Oh, uh, any word if the Quitco will open up for Americans this summer? You know, that's that's the million dollar question around here. It's not just Quetico, but the border in, uh, in general, you know. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of folks with float planes up here and, and hardly anybody put them on floats last summer because the reason you have one up here is to go across the border to your lodge or to go fishing or whatever, and it just didn't make sense. So yeah, I have not heard uh, if Quetico is gonna open or not, but um, I think it's probably gonna be pretty big news when it does. And it's going to be really interesting to see um, outside of Quetico how how the Canadian lodges do because they're you know th that's a whole year without a lot of revenue because a lot of those those border lodges and operations rely on on the U.S. folks coming across. So 
Um, hopefully a, a lot of them haven't just closed up and gone out of business, but um, it'll be interesting to see. Well, thank you very question. much again, Hanny. Go ahead, Laura. There was one other question on there that you missed. Um, they were, someone asked if uh, public use aircraft can shortcut the STC process. I would, I honestly don't know the answer to that. Um, I can tell you that we don't do that here. We, we tend to run the operation like a part 135 operation, even though we're, we're technically part 91, but we, we have STCs for every uh, single thing that we've done to the airplane. And we, we have to get approval through the, the Forest Service Washington office for anything that we want to do on the airplane, even, even like those, the, the bush wheels that we have. So we have to go through the approval process, um, you know, to, to do that and get them approved. So I, I, I know that I, I'm not super smart on public use. I need to be, but um, you know there's some things we can circumvent. I'm not sure that that's one of them. Okay. I have one last question. I'm going to let you go. Um, <laughs> So when did you become Henny Youngman instead of Joel Youngman? And there's a lot of people on this call that will remember who Henny Youngman is. So. Well, that's, that's, a good, that's a good question. So um, it's, a, it's a call sign from the Navy. So when you, when you walk into your first fleet squadron, um, you generally get a call sign. And, and they like to usually base it on something stupid that you've done. Um, but what they do is they, you know, they get your orders and they go, hey, we're getting this new guy next week. You know, we need a call sign for him. So they write your name up on the whiteboard and then everybody goes up there and, you know, makes suggestions, you know, dummy and fathead and stinky or whatever. And well, they, so they wrote my name up and somebody said, well, how do you say his last name? Because it starts with a J. And they said, oh, it's Youngman. And I, I don't know if it, was, it had to be one of the old guys. And he goes, well, it's got to be Henny then. And everybody's like, what are you talking about? Like, you know, Henny Youngman, the comedian. So they're like, yeah, that sounds good. So I show up and they start calling me it and I'm like, Okay, yeah, I, I get it. And so I said, you know what? I'll I'll be fine with that because there's a lot worse call signs like <laughs> that. And so it it kind of stuck. And I, I kind of joke when when people call me by my first name, I'm like, you know, my, my mom is really the only one who calls me that and some of my family, but everybody else kind of knows it. I get it. So <laughs> well, Henny, thank you so much for this evening. It was excellent. We really appreciate it. And uh, great, great presentation. Thanks, Dave. Sorry, I uh, went over a little bit, but oh no, you didn't go over at all. It was just great. It was yep. awesome. And uh, just hey, Steve, I just want to say one last thing is um, we're very big on showing off what we do up here. Not showing it off, but showing it to people. So once we get past the COVID thing, if you're in the area, please come by, and we'll be happy to show you what we like to say are your airplanes and your facility because they're all paid for by you. And um, if you want to see a really great return on your tax dollar. You can look at these airplanes that were bought in the 50s and 60s and that are still flying today that have, that have paid for themselves time and time again. So please come by or if you need to get a hold of me, uh, um, you know, call Steve and he'll give you my number or my email or whatever and get in touch and, and please come by and see us. Great. Thanks again, Henny. Good Thanks night, so everybody. Much. And next week is Ernie Hansen flying to Alaska with his buddies. We will see you all then. Good night. Thanks. Thanks.